and welcome to what I expect to be a very enlightening, empowering, and given silver's current price at exactly its 200-week moving average of roughly 18-15 per ounce, fortuitously timed event for everyone involved, listeners and panelists alike. Knowledge is power, and in the world of precious metals, in this case silver specifically, it would be difficult to find a broader, more experienced group of experts. My name is Andy Hoffman, Marketing Director of Miles Franklin Precious Metals, one of the nation's largest bullion dealers. This week marks my five and a half year anniversary with the firm, but I've been all precious metals since May 2002, more than 15 years ago. During that time, I've been blessed to network with some of the world's most intelligent minds, or as I like to call them, the good smart people. And here at Miles Franklin, I'm privileged to have a platform to share their combined wisdom with the public. Today, we will focus on all relevant aspects of the global silver market, including supply, demand, mining, and trading. The webinar will be roughly an hour long, <clears throat> and I anticipate most, if not all, of this time will be utilized by my questions to the panelists. And now, with such housekeeping out of the way, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel, who are generous enough to give their valuable time from multiple time zones. To start, we have David Morgan, who, before I entered the precious metals realm, was already one of the world's leading silver authorities in all aspects of the industry, from supply and demand to mining, trading, and investing. The Morgan Report can be found at silver-investor.com and is unquestionably one of the leading precious metal-based subscription services. Next, we have Steve St. Angelo of the SRS Rocco Report, found at srsroccoreport.com, who, when we taped the first Miles Franklin Silver All-Star webinar panel in October 2014, I had referred to as the brilliant new kid on the block, but no more, as Steve has been, since become one of the most widely read and respected commentators in the precious metal sector. As a former Wall Street energy analyst myself and mining industry investor relations consultant, I'm particularly interested in his comp commentary on the relationship between mining and energy industries, as in my opinion, the fundamental analysis that was the cornerstone of my career has been largely lost in today's age of market manipulation with few exceptions, such as David, Steve, and Craig. And last but not least, Craig Hemke, formerly known as Turd Ferguson of the TF Metals Report, where Turdites in Turdville gather to discuss the daily precious metal goings on. Since joining the precious metal blogosphere after the 2008 financial crisis, Craig has become a go-to source of all-around analytical information, particularly regarding trading dynamics and the key fundamental economic factors underlying them. In my view, the Silver Investor, SRS Rocco Report, and TF Metals Report are among the finest publications slash websites in the precious metal space, and thus I highly recommend you're at least trying each of them out. To that end, let's dive right in with the issues of supply and demand, by far the most important topic from a macroeconomic perspective. My goal is to generate a broad picture of just how tight the supply-demand balance is starting with mainstream statistics citing roughly 880 million ounces of annual mine production, of which roughly 600 million are utilized in largely indispensable industrial processes, leaving less than 300 million or so for investment purposes, which is a particularly relevant topic in this, our third all-star webinar panel, as per that what we cumulatively forecast in parts one and two in October 2014 and January 2016 respectively, it appears that, like gold, Global silver production did, in fact, peak in 2015, with the potential to decline significantly in the coming years. In fact, last summer, Steve published a report estimating that global silver production could decline by more than 70% over the next decade. Yes, 70%, to levels not seen since the 1960s. To that end, he also published an article yesterday depicting how the world's second largest silver producing nation, Peru, just reported a 12% year-over-year decline in production. That tantalizing teaser aside, David has been the leading authority on this topic for close to two decades, so I'm going to give him the honor of kicking off this segment by sharing his degree of confidence in the official supply data, as well as his forecast for silver production in the coming three to five years. Afterward, Steve and Craig will give their views as we seek to build a consensus estimate of both current and future silver supply and demand. David, I'm going to start with you, so let's get going. Very good. Thank you, Andy. And I just want to make a slight correction. I've rebranded to themorganreport.com, so the most updated information is at themorganreport.com. And if you want a free report on the resource sector, focusing mostly on the precious metals, you can go to um, 
another website will come to me in a minute. I'm already having a senior moment. I'm very excited to be here, and thank you for inviting me. As far as the supply-demand fundamentals go, there was a huge increase in silver supply roughly from the early 2000s to present date. And the reason for that was largely China-driven. So if you look at what the silver stockpile looked like from 1990 to date, what you saw was a decrease in above-ground stockpiles, roughly from 2 billion ounces to a low in 2006 of 500 million ounces. Now, at that time, if you check a chart, the price of silver was not at a peak. The peak came in April, the end of April 2011, when the stockpiles had rebuilt substantially. Now, there's a big argument about if we're in a supply uh, equilibrium, if we're in a deficit or a surplus. It depends how you look at the numbers. If you look at the above ground supplies, they ebbed from 1990 to 2006 from 2 billion ounces to 500 million. And from 2006 to 2017, present day, we're back to 2 billion ounces with a caveat. Half of that is in what uh, the trading mechanics are, commercial bars, what's set at the COMEX by, the <clears throat> by that process. And the other billion ounces are in coins. Now, if you go back to 1990 or 1986, when the Mint started coining, uh, silver because they didn't know what to do with all this quote unquote surplus. The most that was ever bought was around 10 million ounces annually. That has substantially increased over the last several years and not, roughly now about 40 million ounces and that's just in the U.S. Other nation states that produce coins and of course private mints as well. So there's a huge amount of coins out there in the mostly public domain. There are some institutions that hold them but largely it's the public. So one part of the equation that's lost is what is the total supply? Supply and demand have to equal every year, and they do. And what's supposed to conduct that is price. So if something is very scarce, it's the last bidder at the auction that receives the good that's being bid on. It would hold true in a true free market for any, any commodity, any stock, any house, any car, whatever. What we have is a deficit if you only look at mining supply versus total demand. But what many don't account for is that there is a huge amount of recycled silver. Now, I've probably been guilty of not painting the most accurate picture. It's been inadvertent. But there's roughly, depending on which study you look at, 160 million ounces of silver that is recycled on an annual basis. So if you add total supply, which is mine supply and recycling, and total demand, there's actually a balance or perhaps a slight surplus. Now, if you look at investment demand, which Steve does and is in black and white, I won't argue. I mean, I'm friends with several at the Silver Institute. If you look at investment demand, there is a deficit. So it depends, and I'm not trying to play a semantics game. I'm trying to be very accurate and very objective. So we have, if you look at, are the above ground stockpiles building or not? Are they waning or building? They're building. So that you can make your own conclusion on. That's an objective fact. Is there a deficit? Depends how you define it or a shortage. Depends on your definition. If you look at investment demand, industrial demand, all demand, then there is a lot more silver that is required to meet that balance. So I tend to just go with what is happening on the above ground supply. I think it's easier to understand. Now I want to make one more caveat. I'll turn it over. If you think the only reason to invest in silver is because it's in a deficit, you're not thinking. Because gold stockpile adds to the overall above ground supply year after year after year after year. Gold is held for a specific reason, basically to protect your wealth. Silver has the advantage that not only will protect your wealth, it usually does multiples better than gold in a, cri in a financial crisis, and the stock is being repurchased. I'm using that metaphor to say there's always this industrial demand that will not go away. It's an indispensable metal, as Andy started the conference with. It has to be used, especially in all things electronic which means the more high-tech the world gets, the more per capita 
silver is used on a global basis. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Well, and we'll go. We'll go on to what the uh, views of Steve and Craig are on this topic, and then because this is a big topic, we're going to move. We'll separately discuss the supply outlook, meaning mine production. So let's stick to supply demand right now as it is. Uh, Steve, uh, what do, what do you see? Do you agree with Dave, David, that we are somewhere between a deficit and a surplus, but certainly not a giant one in either direction right now? Well, yeah, Dave brought up a lot of good information, and uh, it, it's also how you look at the numbers, and he's right. You can look at it on, on annual, uh, what is known as a net balance, supply or deficit, surplus or deficit. Now, what I was able to do is I, I, I was able to receive an, an Excel chart from GFMS, one of their top silver uh, analysts there, and they sent me this, what is their supply uh, surplus and deficit since 1975. And so when you look at this Excel spreadsheet, you'll see from 1975 to 1987, uh, the market suffered or experienced surpluses every year. Now the reason for that was in the in the 60s, a lot of silver late 60s, which was official coins, American, other countries. Uh, a lot of these official coins were purchased by investors when silver was taken out of official coinage, and a lot of that silver was remelted. Some of it was kept as junk silver, uh, but a lot of it was remelted, and that that came into the market in the 70s. A lot of investors held on to that silver. And so from 75 to 87, we had surpluses. For two, for three years, from 88 to 90, we had deficits. And then again in the 90s, basically 91 to 99, we had almost 10 years of surpluses. Well, interesting, since 2000, for 17 years, consecutive years, we've suffered 1.8 billion in deficits when you add them up all together. And so, but when you look at the whole thing, since 1975 to 2016, there's still about 300 million ounces out there. But that's not a lot. Uh, the last year, there was 185 million ounce deficit. So people ask me, okay, Steve, what, how much silver is out there? Well, there's, there's a lot of above ground silver out there, as David mentioned, maybe 2 billion ounces. But a lot of it is held in, in very strong hands. Half of that is held in private hands in, 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 let's say, official coins, and the other half is held in, in bars. But what we have seen since 2000 is an ongoing, uh, let's say, drawdown of this surplus silver that we've had in the market. Again, it used to be official coins. They were melted into the market, and now industry has been consuming a lot of silver that we'll never see again as well as a lot of investment now. We didn't have a lot of investment back in early 2000s. I mean, investment has really picked up considerably. So right now, I agree with David that you shouldn't invest in silver because it's in, a let's say, a structural annual deficit. But the big difference between gold and silver, and I'll tell you this, since 2010 to 2016, Investors bought 1.5 billion ounces of silver bar and coin. That, that's a lot of silver compared to, like, let's say, 284 million ounces of gold. Now, the difference between the silver physical market and the gold physical market, in the same time, the silver market has suffered an 800 million ounce deficit, if you add them all up. The gold market actually has a, a 7.5 million ounce surplus. So even though there's, the gold is still out there in hands as well as the silver, what we're seeing, we're seeing a much more drastic drawdown of, of, of let's say, the, the, the silver that has been stockpiled by the world in the market. And it's been taken away, and now it's held in much stronger hands. So I wanted to conclude, I think the silver, uh, the silver situation is in much tighter, it's, it's in much explosive than gold going forward. Right, and before we get to uh, Craig, obviously we're, this is a separate topic. I was going to address it next, but you know we'll get to it eventually, which is inventories, because again, all these numbers we're talking about for inventories are tiny amounts. I mean, we're talking about, you know, like the COMEX has $500 million of registered silver, and again, you, know, you talk about the drawdown, 
at the financial crisis in 2008, there were 85 million ounces of registered silver on the COMEX, and today there's only 30 million. So all these numbers of inventories, whether, whether they're 2 billion or 1 billion or 5 billion, are small amounts of numbers, which we'll get to in a second. But I'll, I'll just finish the topic with Craig, if you have anything to add on the supply-demand balance. And again, we haven't even gotten to mine production supply, so we're going to do that right after your comments on this particular topic. Craig. Well, uh, I, I know uh, David and Steve, I've known them both a long time, and I respect them greatly. And the information they provide is invaluable. Uh, but I would take this, uh, this conversation in an entirely different direction and postulate that physical silver supply and demand has very little impact on price. And we can talk about above ground supplies. And, uh, we can talk about how much silver is left over annually for investment. But when so much of that investment, if you want to call it that, is in synthetic silver, in digital silver, whether it's shares of the SLV, whether it's derivative contracts in New York or London, or whether it's uh, unallocated pooled accounts in Switzerland, uh, I think that the, the banks have mastered a form of alchemy where they have taken what should be physical demand for silver and driven it into this synthetic imaginary silver. And it is the trading of the synthetic imaginary silver that sets price. And so all of the supply demand physical fundamentals are certainly important, and I don't mean to downplay them. But I think that they play a secondary role in determining price. And so uh, until the current pricing scheme is addressed and changed and fails, um, all of the talk about mine supply and above ground supplies, I don't think to me, it doesn't matter a whole lot. So anyway, okay. I, that's where I would. That's where I stand on all this. No, this this is a great opening salvo because, like, like a great movie, you know, we build up to the end, and obviously, um, this is a, a a very important topic to all of us, and it's uh, certainly to me, and it's going to be Craig the last thing that we discuss. So have no fears. We are <laughs> just setting the base uh, in the re in the reality of the physical world which eventually always wins, because uh, what you're talking about is a temporary change in, in reality, but the you know, economic mother nature will eventually win. But we'll get to that in a second. And I so, want to stress, I mean, and yeah. I just want to stress, I mean, that's just my personal opinion from observing these markets all these years. Uh, that's in no way meant to disparage what David does or what Steve does. I think it's valuable, and I, I, I read their stuff all the time. But I just, in terms of determining price, uh, sometimes I feel like we're looking in the wrong direction. That's all. Right. Well, look, we're all looking in that same direction. We're building a mosaic here. Yes. Andy, let me just add, I totally yes. agree with uh, Craig. I, he's, he's correct. I, actually, I, I agree with him more than he thinks. I think the issue is to, to qualify this supply and demand situation. Um, it, it has an effective price. And matter of fact, when we've had more, we've had a lot more uh, demand for uh, silver investment when the price was, was at its lowest. Uh, and then in 2012, when That's the true. price was at its highest, we, it was, uh, we, had a lower, we had lower demand. So the thing is, but these, these supply and demand situations, what I look at is a long-term trend, a long-term trend. And, and, and what's happening? It, so seeing uh, like uh, in, in the early 2000s, uh, silver investment was like uh, an eighth of jewelry investment. Now silver investment is 80% of jewelry investment. So uh, this is a big change. And it, what it's doing is it's putting more pressure on their overall system. But again, I agree with Craig that it, it is a, monarch, a market manipulation of price. Yes, of course, but uh, unlike the stock markets, which are all paper, there is physical underlying, and that's the same problem with the oil market. They want the price higher, but they're having trouble doing it. Look, they, they want the price of gold and silver lower than they are, but they're having trouble doing it. And, you know, you go back to what, you know, I first learned when I started reading GATA 15 years ago, uh, the physical market will eventually win, and it is winning in many parts of the world right now, so I'm not worried. We're just setting the stage in this call letting people know that the supply-demand trends underlying the physical market are getting tighter, and then we'll address the, uh, the paper realities that we're dealing with at the moment. So I still I want to get back to the issue of mine production. It's very important. Back in 2014, uh, in our first silver webinar panel, we, uh, as we expected that the, that the production would eventually fall in time due to a combination of 
of uh, base metal mine and primary silver mine declines for a variety of reasons. And here we are, uh, where it looks like for both gold and silver, production has, in fact, uh, declined starting or peaked starting in 2015. So let's go around the panel and, and get our expectations for where mine production is going to be in the coming years. Um, and I guess we'll start right now with, uh, with Steve because Dave is, uh, is logging back in. Yeah, Andy, uh, it does look like 2015 may be the, the overall peak for silver production. And according to uh, GFMS, there, they had, I think, 893 million ounces was the number that they, uh, was the peak for uh, 2015. And they're, they're forecasting 887 million uh, last year for 2016. So it's not quite 1%, but it's a decline. Now, uh, as I mentioned in my uh, recent article on Peru, it was really interesting to see, uh, Peru was the, was the, I would say the largest increase in silver production uh, last year was for Peru. They really jumped. Mexico actually declined, but Peru really increased, and part of that was due to, they did a lot, they brought on some really big copper mines. So we had some base metal uh, byproduct silver production coming from Peru, and so they were really strong last year. But I noticed in January, production actually declined year over year. And then February, as you mentioned, uh, I think they declined 44 metric tons, which is like one and a half million ounces uh, for uh, February. So it looks like their silver production is starting to decline, um, as well as their gold production. So now I had made a, an article, a forecast, that I see silver production really uh, falling off a cliff. now. This is a way out idea. This is a very different forecast than most, let's say, uh, mainstream or even alternative because it's due to the energy. I think we're going to see a huge problem with energy going forward. And the, the biggest problem is going to be with oil. And if you need oil to run all the haul trucks and to, to produce uh, a gold and silver. So I think we're going to see lots of trouble with the U.S. and global oil production within a decade. And I think by five years, it's going to be a lot of fireworks. So as oil production really declines, it's going to really severely impact economic activity in the world, which will hurt silver a lot more than gold because about 70% of silver is byproduct. And so most of that is zinc, lead, and copper production. I think 56% of silver production comes from zinc, lead, and copper. Well, these are base metals. Well, if we start to see, once this, this market cracks and we start to see a decline in economic activity, then we're going to see huge declines in copper, zinc, and lead production. So I see uh, production declining over the next few years, but when things really start getting out of control with the market, we're going to see huge drops, and now most of it is due to base metal mining. So I think I think within five ten years we're going to see a whole different a whole different supply. It's going to be a lot less than what it is today. Right, and a lot of what you're talking about is kind of your proprietary research regarding uh, the energy industry and its impact on precious metals. So. We're going to move next to David, who is focused more on actually looking at mine to mine. So it's another perspective. So David, what is your current view for what mine production for silver will look like over the next, let's say, five to ten years? Uh, very similar to Steve. I really respect his work, and I'll add on to it in a second. I just wanted to compliment Craig and say that uh, the reason I made that big point or tried to that the bottom of the physical supply and the commercial bars was in 2006, checked the price, and the peak in the market was 2011, and the amount of above ground silver was far higher. So I agree with them because the paper paradigm. But I also want to add a bit more because we have seen silver shortages, and that was during the 2008 crisis and a couple other times. But unfortunately, it was only in the retail market, meaning what the average investor buys, you know, one ounce coins, 10 ounce bars, 100 ounce bars, that type of thing. I've only seen very close to what I would consider a silver shortage on the commercial side when Eric Sprott started the PSLV. I actually was sitting shoulder to shoulder with Eric and some of his analysts in Toronto in their office, and they were asking me some questions about the fund and, and opening it up and, and some various questions. So they started the fund. 
and the initial purchase was, I believe it was 22 million ounces of fine silver, and Eric had pointed out that, uh, I won't name the bank, I want to be careful here, but one of the Canadian uh, main dealers that uh, warehouses said no problem. And I had already brought a bunch of material with me. I pointed out to Eric that that's impossible. They don't even have that much in the register category. There's no way they could fill a 22 million ounce order. And they kind of smiled. So they put the order in. The interesting part of this is that the contract was not fulfilled on the date specified, which means that the bars they were getting after that date were basically freshly minted, which meant the supply chain was very, very, very tight. If you fast forward to the next year or two, when they did another raise, they bought another, I think it was 20 million ounces the second time. And I was flabbergasted as well as Mr. Eric Sprott, and put the words in his mouth, I was flabbergasted, I, and he seemed to concur when I spoke with him, that they were able to fulfill that second order much more easily than the first time. The point I'm making is that I don't want to emphasize is that Craig is correct. As long as the paper paradigm can, can match the demand side of the equation, which most of these people are speculating or gambling on the price movement and not actual physical silver, the game will continue. But the supply demand side uh, is much tighter than the price alone would indicate. And now on to the mine uh, part of the equation. And, and, and let me add, let me add here, David, to this topic. Um, again, people were talking about the start. David's talking about the start of the PSLV uh, closed-end fund, which was in, I believe, October of 2010, and uh, it was that was what started the price of silver going from $20 an ounce, roughly at that time, up to $50 an ounce less than a year later. And uh, it was actually the time I deemed uh, Eric Sprott Admiral Sprott because it was quite clear that that fund was the biggest catalyst for pushing the physical price up that high. And uh, that's why last year it's not a coincidence that the, the PSLV, which, you know, in my opinion, the cartel holds the price down so it doesn't trade at a premium because of deals like that. Uh, when it was able to actually do a deal last year, last spring, uh, it's not a coincidence that it was right around the time that the silver price bottomed. It was only maybe two months after. So again, when people are, are worried about, well, the paper price will be held, will hold the physical, will hold the, you know, the this, the derivatives will hold the price down. The fact is, when institutions enter the market, as Eric Sprott's funds did when they initiated the PSLV, uh, and also when the CEF was doing giant deals at around that same time, uh, it made a, a meaningful move uh, up in the price, and it caused the shortages that we saw in 2011. Look, it's not a surprise. It shouldn't be shocking. That the cartel had to go had to you know go through the, that whole Saturday uh, Sunday night paper massacre in 2011 and pretend that they got Osama bin Laden and and then in September of 2011 they had to attack again on the day that the Swiss were pegging the franc to the euro. The point is there was major institutional participation in the market that was that was straining the physical supplies back then, and trust me. That physical participation is going to come back at the time of the next crisis, which may be any time. So on that note, we're going to move on to mine production. So, David, you can continue from there. Very good. So I just want to emphasize mostly what Steve uh, said. I mean, Steve does great work, and, you know, you've got to put energy into everything. It is the king commodity. As much as I love precious metals, without oil, nothing on this planet really happens. If you look at our work in the Silver Manifesto, I'll still not retract anything in there. There's a possibility that we have not peaked in silver supply. But even if you take the best case scenario, and we took kind of a neutral case, kind of a middle of the road case, uh, there is a potential to have an increased silver supply over the next few years. That said, it's dependent on the price of oil. Part of the reason that you're seeing a lower supply, and there's lots of reasons, and I don't want to nitpick, I agree with Steve again, but is these guys have got a high grade. I mean, for these, even the Peruvians, the Mexicans, wherever you are on the planet, there are very, very few high-grade silver mines left anymore, anywhere in the world. And even if you have a low wage rate, you still are eking out a living in the silver mine. And Steve did another article I want to compliment him on, and that's it. Isn't it interesting how the price of silver and gold seem to just stay right around the cost of production? 
You know, not the supply-demand fundamentals that a free market would dictate, not the premium you would get for a safe haven, not for the usefulness of silver and how demanded it is in, in technology. No, no, no. It's basically kind of just always gravitates, with these exceptions here and there, to the cost of production. So it's basically the cost of production. If you see oil go back to $150 a barrel, then those mining districts that are in the book uh, go by the buy and buy. And just to add further and try to be succinct because Steve's already covered this, it's a base metal mining problem. 70% roughly comes, as he said, lead, zinc, and copper. In fact, 13% of the silver supply comes from gold mining. So the point is, once this contraction continues and the dislocations that we're already witnessing and are continuing to get worse and worse and worse, and now with this, this war cry, the, the most important commodities are going to be the metals, the precious metals, in particular silver, because silver is a metal of war. As much as I don't like to say it, it's true. So I don't have anything further to add other than, yeah, I might uh, say there's a possibility we could get an increase. But again, it is oil dependent. It's price dependent. Right, but I, I don't think anyone, and we'll go on to, uh, to Craig's view also, believes that there's going to be at even in the best case scenario, a significant increase in silver production, whereas opposed to copper, where you're seeing record inventories and rising production at a time where, yes, I mean, I guess war could make the <laughs> could make demand increase, but that would certainly be good for silver. But certainly, industrial demand is not going anywhere right now. So I think it's kind of the best of both worlds. Um, Craig, do you have anything to add on your expectation for mine production? I would just follow on exactly what uh, Steve and Dave both said. Uh, it was because maybe three quarters of silver production annually comes as a byproduct of mining base metals. It, it, some of that demand, I mean, some of the supply of silver is a function of demand for those other base metals. If if it's profitable to go in there and mine zinc and and lead and and everything else, then they're going to be mining zinc and lead and everything else, and silver is going to come along for the ride, and there's going to be more silver that's mined. But if we get into a situation where you know this global deflation continues, a global economic malaise continues, and there's not much economic growth any place. Well, then the demand for those base metals is going to continue to fall, which means the price of those base metals will probably also fall, and that's going to make base metal mining less attractive, which is going to uh, draw down the amount of supply that comes out of mines for silver. And so those things are all connected and. And that's why the points that uh, both Steve and Dave made are, are the best. Right. And, we're, again, we're in a sweet spot here because, as I, as I wrote in my uh, silver fundamentals in the base metal mining bubble, there is no shortage of copper, zinc, or lead out there. And um, so there's, and there's certainly going, you know, the direction of global trade is down. I mean, we are in a recession in a lot of the world, and the rest is going to be there soon. So unless we do have wartime demand, which is a whole nother story, uh, there's going to be uh, no chance <laughs> that there's going to be some big surge in, uh, in, 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 uh, in mining of copper, lead, and zinc that's going to you know, cause some giant increase in supply. And again, we're talking about small amounts of supply of silver compared to the demand. So I don't think anyone is expecting, as opposed to many of the other commodities in the world, any kind of major increase in the supply of, of silver. And by the way, gold... Uh, which there's far better numbers on because it's it's mostly a primary metal um, is is declining dramatically and again that's you know 30 percent of silver demand uh, of silver production comes from gold mines and right now even uh, Standard and Poor's Credit Suisse they're expecting 20 to 25 percent declines in gold production over the next five to ten years I mean so you know there's not going to be a lot of silver that's coming to market and uh, so. The next topic, we're, again, we've talked about the next topic many times before. It was hinted at earlier before. I just want people to realize whether we have a supply or demand deficit, uh, it's kind of immaterial because these are not giant deficits or, 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 uh, or surpluses. The point is there's not much inventory out there, and I think David has all along said that there's probably about 2 billion ounces out there. Uh, probably a lot of it is in strong hands. Um, if that's the case, and, uh, you know, again, the COMEX, they say that they have 30 million ounces. This is, uh, this, is, this is chump change. Then there's really a very fine line right now between the amount of, of physical silver available for sale and what 
could happen if you have any kind of, of institutional demand into the market. So, David, uh, do you agree that that number of 2 billion ounces of ava available for sale silver is somewhere in the ballpark? Yeah, I do. Again, it's split pretty much between commercial bars and coins, and the coins are extremely strong hands, and a lot of commercial bars are, are held for investment purposes. Just to defend my TMR members, zinc actually, I'd argue with you slightly, Andy, I'm just going to drop it. Um, you can make a case zinc is fairly tight, and one of our uh, silver zinc plays is actually doing quite well. Uh, but those will be the mines, if zinc is needed, that you will see. You see the ones that have high silver credits uh, being sought after first. Coming back to the supply, Jeff Christian actually did an excellent presentation, in my opinion, and I know Jeff isn't the most popular in this forum, but I give credit where credit is due, and he did a... Uh, presentation at the Silver Summit in November in San Francisco, and I actually had him redo it for some of our members. The point is that if you took all financial a assets, X real estate, so we're not talking real estate investment whatsoever, we're just talking about stocks and bonds, and you equated what the percentages are as far as the precious metals, of all financial as assets on a worldwide basis, the total of gold is roughly 1%. Silver, and I couldn't believe it, I, I actually called him on it, is 0.02%. So think about it. In the next financial crisis, I think Greg Hunter is right. You're gonna, it's going to come to a point where either you have it or you don't have it. I may be wrong on that. But the, again, to repeat, and it's probably the most important thing I can say on this panel, is that the price is not reflective of how tight the silver supply is right now because it's not a matter of how much is above ground. It's a matter of like in the stock market, what is the float? What is the amount that's willing to be purchased at the current given price? And if everybody says, I'm not selling my silver until it gets to X, and X is let's make up a number of $25, then nothing's going to happen in the physical realm. The problem is, of course, there's this paper paradigm that's basically uh, convoluted the true dynamics of a lot of markets. In fact, I argue all markets. So I'm off on a tangent. I'll, I'll just stop there. Thanks, Andy. No, you're, you're absolutely correct. And, and, and I'll add my two cents, of course, as the marketing director of one of the largest bullion dealers uh, in the country. So shortages of silver have become a way of life, and uh, the only reason that we haven't had one, let's say, this year is just because this you know, paper alchemy has been taken, you know, they stair-step higher. The, the more that the, 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 the world falls into, uh, into a state of monetary and economic failure, the more they rig markets. Uh, you know, a perfect example is after the election. Uh, when Trump won, and all of a sudden they said, "No, we got to make, we got to push prices of gold down and, and create a bubble in stocks and, and base metals," and it's gotten to the point where, where the dislocation has never been larger uh, between the between reality and financial markets. But the fact is, again, we're talking about tiny supplies of silver out there. During the 2008 crisis, which was a real crisis, we ran out of silver. In fact, we ran out of gold to an extent. The premiums on gold were over 30 percent, but in silver. By October 2008, we were out as an industry uh, for maybe two months, and the premiums were 100%. So at the time, I didn't own really any silver, but I owned a lot of mining stocks, and I owned ETFs and, you know, like or, or closed-end funds, and I got destroyed. But if I had just owned physical silver at the time, it didn't go down in price. And we've since then, uh, whether we've had in 2011 when the prices went up, we ran out. In 2013, after the alternative currencies destruction raids, uh, after Obama had his closed door meeting with the with the too big to fail banks, we ran out of silver. 2015, around the time of the Shemitah, ran out of silver. So again, we haven't had, a, as I call, the most overdue financial crisis in history in a while. But it's coming, and when it does, we're going to run out of silver. And since there's less production coming out of the ground now than ever before, uh, well, I should say there's less growth than ever before, and there's certainly as low amount of inventory as ever before and stronger hands than ever before, it's, there's going to be a shortage. Uh, so on that, uh, on that topic, uh, next I want to go to something which I think everyone is going to be able to contribute to. Um, you know, we're talking about the amount, the, the ability of mines to produce. Now, it's, it's one thing to say, well, the oil price is an influence. Another thing to say, well, the silver price, it, it's surging, it's plunging, it has an influence. But the fact is, there hasn't been a lot of exploration in the last decade because of the price strangulation. 
and there's been a lot of debt that's been accumulated and a lot of shares that have been issued and warrants. So I want from all of your perspectives to tell me what you think the current state of the mining industry is. Since I left the industry in 2011, so I only have a peripheral view, but all of you are watching it a lot more closely. So let's start with Craig in this case. Craig, how would you view the state of the mining industry and its ability to finance itself and to produce into the future? Well, I've got to be honest with you, Andy. I'm not sure that that's really my area of expertise. Um, I, I don't study individual mines very very much. I only own a few mining shares myself, choosing instead to to really focus upon this derivative market and the supply and the demand of the derivatives. And, and I just would add, I, David had an excellent points back then uh, a few minutes ago, and it is uh, all of these forms of synthetic silver that have been fed into the global market to cover up that, you know, that little bit of in, in silver that's left over every year to meet investment demand. But in terms of the mining sector, I'm just going to be quiet because I think Steve and David could add a lot more than I could by uh, flapping my gums. Okay. Well, we'll, say, we'll save you for the best topic of all at, at the end, which we're coming to. So, uh, Steve, why don't you start us off? How would you, how would you and again, you, we, let's combine in this question. One, what do you think the current cost of production is on average for the industry? And two, do you believe the industry is in a, a state of health financially and as far as the reserves they've built up to sustain itself uh, in the coming years? Okay, good questions, uh, Andy. Before I, before I get into that, I wanted to uh, add one more thing on, on the previous topic about the how much gold and silver is out there. And this is important. It kind of confirms what David was saying. According to my analysis from USGS, GFMS, as well as CPM Group, there's about 2.2 billion ounces of gold in that central bank as well as private investors. And there's about 2.5 billion ounces of silver and uh, about. So it's about the 2 billion ounce uh, number. Now, the interesting thing is uh, the 2.2 billion ounces of gold is worth $3 The 2.5 billion ounces of silver at the time of the article was worth 51 billion. It's peanuts. So we can see there, even though there's more silver, well, what we understand is there's not much more silver out there than there's gold. So it's it's almost a one to one, but the value of it is 60 times less. Now, why is that important? Now, the reason that's important, and I wrote this article, the U.S. deficit, the U.S. Uh, let's say budget deficits from 2011 to 15, if you add them up every year, they were 4.2 trillion, our budget deficits. Now, if you take all the silver and gold that has been produced in 30 years, 30 years, that's what the deficits could purchase. That, that just goes to show you how screwed up the situation is. Our borrowing in the last five years could purchase 30 years worth of all global silver and gold production. Now, the, the question you asked me about the mine the mining industry. The reason why the mining industry is doing did a little better uh, in 2016 all had to do with oil. Oil fell. It fell two thirds in the beginning of 2016 from over $100 in the middle of 2014. It fell down below 30 in the beginning of 2016. This hurt the oil industry, but it helped the mining industry because uh, energy is a major factor in the cost of producing gold and silver. So I actually this morning, I haven't been looking at the data of the miners recently, but I looked at the top six, which is Pan, Amer Pan America Core, Tahoe, Silver Standard, Heckler, and First Majestic. And according to my analysis, my break even, uh, Tahoe had the lowest, which is like 13, but they're, they're kind of an extreme case. But if you look at the other ones, they were anywhere between 15 and, and 16, and then if you get down to the smaller producers, it's going to be closer to 17. So what we're seeing, what we're seeing is the, the low oil price has also lowered the cost of production, but most of their benefit happened in the beginning of 2016. Now, as the price of oil has gone up at the end of 2016, their last quarter, I've, I've noticed that their uh, incomes, their incomes weren't as good as they were in the beginning of the year. At, we also have to remember the price of silver and gold really shut up in the beginning of 2016 when the Dow Jones really fell 2,000 points. So they were getting uh, really low oil price and a, and a good uh, silver price. 
So this year, I think if the price of oil remains in 50 or below, a lot of these miners are still going to be, they're going to make money. Now, over a longer period of time, I look at the silver market, and I'll conclude with this, Andy. The silver miners, to me, are the, are the best stocks, better than in gold, because it, it takes about one-fifth of a gallon of diesel to produce an ounce of silver, and it takes 32 gallons of diesel to produce an ounce of gold. So when the oil industry starts to suffer, it'll be much easier to produce silver than it's going to be to produce gold. So I look at the mining industry, the silver mining industry in particular, as one of the best assets to own in the future, future besides physical gold and silver. And the reason why, the top primary silver miners, their, their capitalization is $27 billion. That's it. If you add up the top ones, $27 billion. And that's even including Fresnillo. Now, if you look at ExxonMobil, there's like $350 billion, their market cap. So I look right to conclude the mining industry now is making money. They didn't make money in 2015 or 2014, but they are making some money now. But they're not making a lot of money. And so I don't see the price of silver falling too much because we're going to see the cost of production be about where it is right now. Great. That's great commentary. And I'd like David to follow up with the added part of given how much they've explored in recent years and how much debt they've put on, will they be able to dramatically increase production no matter what the oil price is? And of course, you know, plunging oil prices t tends to lead to crisis, which tends to increase uh, demand for silver for completely different reasons. And, you know, conversely, if the price of oil goes to $150 a barrel, it's going to be due to major inflation concerns that are going to reflect in silver demand as well. So we win on both ends. But, David, what's your view of the state of the mining industry? And I'm not talking about are they currently profitable this minute, which, as Steve is saying, they're mildly profitable because we're around the cost of production. But have they explored enough in recent years to sustain production uh, without financially overburdening themselves in the coming years? Well, a couple of things. I'd say that first that the worst of the mining industries behind us, uh, there was basically no capital available for several years. That has loosened up. During that extremely difficult time for the miners, many of them went to pot. I made a joke about that, but it's also true. A lot of these smaller situations that really aren't mines or exploration situations are gone. The real deals, the near producers, or producers that have exploration potential, there is some viability there and there is some growth potential. However, again, you know, probably repeating too much, it's, it's oil dependent more than anything else. The financing is there for worthwhile projects. So is there a growth potential? The answer is yes, there is a possibility of further growth. Is it substantial? No. Is it something that uh, we should watch? Of course, but as Steve said, and I'll add on to it, not only is it more efficient to get silver out of the ground on an energy cost basis, it's also more important. I mean, if we go back to the start of the 1986 Silver Liberty Program, commonly known as the Silver Eagle, what we find was that it came out of what's called the strategic stockpile. Google that word. It was absolutely required for the government to hold it. And the only thing that I know of in the federal government that makes a profit is the mint. Everything else is a huge loser, and I think everybody that follows Andy Hoffman certainly knows that. I want to digress slightly and go to the U.S. debt clock. If you like the U.S. debt clock and you go over to the far lower right-hand side, what you'll see is what the <clears throat> dollars printed per uh, unit of a given commodity and many other things. There's all kinds of debt on the debt clock. But they actually, I don't know why they do this, but I'm thankful that they do. They show a dollar to silver ratio at $885 per ounce. And the dollar to silver ratio in 1913 was $2.64 per ounce. This is basically debt versus ounces. In gold, it's not uh, as significant as it is in silver, which comes back to what Steve said about is the ratio important. And yes, it is. I mean, the markets are not as efficient as this 
market theory that there are efficient markets. Markets get distorted, and are more distorted than ever, as Craig has said, because of this paper paradigm. I mean, if you really think it through, it's whenever a silver trade is made and satisfied, it's as if this piece of paper represents a physical reality, and it doesn't. But it's as if if you made a cartoon out of it, if someone would be taking this thing and they're saying, here's this silver, and in reality, it's nothing but but yet we pretend all the time that these things are real. It's a very, very convoluted situation we're living in. And in fact, I've referred to it as a matrix, and in some cases, I think I can make a strong argument for that. Yeah, and, and of course, look, the gold-silver ratio, you can argue for what it should be, which we all know is a lot lower, but the fact is it didn't make this break from reality until the early 70s, right, when the COMEX came into being, and because it's a much smaller market, and clearly a, let's call it, canary in the coal mine because of the tight supply that's out there, it's become uh, a very important strategic uh, market for, to be manipulated in this manner to make it look uh, worthless. Because, I, you know, I don't need to ask all of you uh, what direction that gold-silver ratio is going to go. We know it's going to go, look, in 2011 it went from 90 down to 35 in a matter of weeks, and it's going to go to 35 again, and it's probably going to go a lot lower uh, when when you have the next crisis and people are are clamoring for physical metal, uh, so on that top uh, off that topic because that's one I think we all know is 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 going to happen. I want to just touch on demand, or i.e. the pink elephant in the room, and then we're going to move on to trading. Uh, now, according to the official data, Indian silver demand shattered its record high in 2015, as did U.S. Mint and Royal Canadian Mint silver bullion sales. And this was while the cartel was attacking paper prices to their lowest level since the bull market started at the turn of the century. Uh, and, if, and ironically, the trough of prices was when the Fed started raising rates in December 2015. Now, Chinese silver demand is not published, but given their enormous gold appetite, their official policy of purchasing all domestic production, and they don't have uh, onerous tariffs that you have in, say, India, it's likely that, that Chinese silver demand is is near the record level as well. Um, but then you have what's going on this year, uh, where all of a sudden the mints are reporting plunging sales. And yes, at Miles Franken, we've definitely seen a decline in sales, which is probably related to the um, to the stock bubble that's been created, because I think the one thing that, that drives demand more than anything these days, aside from just rising price, is falling stock market. Uh, so. Assuming no, no black swan kind of demand materializes, I wanted to know what, what everyone thinks uh, of the current demand numbers that are out there, not just for the U.S. and Canadian mints, but for the world. I mean, Steve, David, Craig, where do you think demand is going to be this year relative to last year uh, if we don't have, like, Marine Le Pen winning the election? Uh, who did you want to go first? Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead. I'll take it. Yeah, it... it um Everything seemed to have changed when Trump was elected in November. You know, the first day of his, you know, when we knew he was going to be elected, uh, gold and silver price shot up and the Dow Jones was being hammered. But the next day it turned around. So what this has done is it, it, it's, it, it has taken away, not only has it taken away, uh, uh, let's say, silver investment demand, sentiment is much lower, as well as the, uh, I've also heard from different sources that the uh, the people trying to protect for collapse, uh, survival, survival uh, products have also fallen, as well as uh, uh, guns and ammo. So it, it all kind of relates together. It's fear of, of a collapse, fear of a crash, and, that, and, and that's what we're seeing. It, it's all kind of worked together. And so, yet, yeah, silver investment demand probably has fallen significantly in the first three months of the year. But you see, this doesn't this doesn't bother me at all. This is what I call the the, uh, the calm before the storm, or this we're in the eye of the hurricane, and then we're going to go back out again. Because what Trump is doing now, he's he's really he can't do much um, with the energy is such a big problem and the massive amount of debt. So what we're seeing now is we're seeing a pause in in purchasing. Um, it hasn't affected the price. The price is still in the $18 range. So as Craig has mentioned, the supply and demand has really affected the price. Uh, so what I see going forward, and 
this depends upon what's going to happen with the debt ceiling limit. Um, we're seeing so many indicators in the market now that things are going to start falling apart, and they are. When the market really starts to crash, unless they do hyperinflation, we're going to see, uh, uh, I think we're going to see a much bigger increase in investment demand. Uh, and I mean, I've got one chart here that I want to tell you. This is what's fascinating. From 2007 to 2011, when the price hit the high, like you said, there was 687 million ounces of physical silver investment. There was 419 million went into ETFs. That was a lot of silver that went into ETFs. Don't know if it's all there. But now, after, from 2012 to 2016, physical investment demand was 1.1 billion, and ETF was only 112 million ounces. It's a tenth of what it of the physical. So right now there is very little, uh, let's say, retail or institutional investment demand, and that's where I see the big change, Andy. I see when the market starts to crash and really start to collapse, I see uh, much more in institutions now for the first time really moving into the ETFs and really purchasing a lot more silver as well as physical silver from uh, regular uh, precious metal investors. That's what I see going forward once the market really starts to crash. Right, and I'll add to that, you know, it's ironic. We're talking about that fear has gone down because of Trump, but look what is ha I mean, it's obviously going to change because look what's happened since. I mean, we're at the verge of war right now. Uh, mar the market is certainly telling us that things are going the wrong direction. You know, rates are plunging. The dollar is plunging. Obviously, someone is buying precious metals. It may not be U.S. investors, uh, but it's certainly people in the rest of the world that have been watching their currencies crash because otherwise the price wouldn't be going up, as David mentioned at the very beginning, because that's what matches supply and demand. And, uh, of course, you know, the inventories are obviously a lot lower than they were at the time of the last crisis because, uh, because the demand is a lot higher. I mean, the amount of retail buying even today is, uh, is, is uh, pretty close to what it was in 2008. You know, in two two years ago, it was two or three times as much as it was at the peak of the 2008 crisis. So I think, you know, the kind of things that have caused weakening demand here in the United States, Trumpflation meme and, you know, surging stock markets, are things that are getting very close to, uh, to switching on a dime. Uh, D David, what is your view on where demand is right now and where you expect it to be? for the remainder of the year, assuming we don't have any kind of black swan events. And do you have an opinion of who has been buying to make the price go up, given that we've had such a dramatic retail uh, decline here? Yeah, I'm actually somewhat bearish. I'm, in fact, writing a report I'll have for free for everybody in the next month or so. I think the market's saturated at the retail level. I think most uh, silver investors have had enough or had it with the price or given up. Certainly there's people that stack every month and I, I commend them. But uh, the demand side is what Steve said. I think it's the institutions. I remember being in London and speaking about uh, I'd never seen the silver supply so tight. And I'm not saying I had any influence, although I may have, because there's a lot of fund managers in London and they started playing the ETF game as Steve outlined and the price definitely took off. But it's always demand, and if it, wherever it comes from, and I don't care, silver never asks, you know, or am I being put in a cell phone or am I being stored in, you know, somebody's stack. It doesn't care what the, the, the demand is. It's just demand. Uh, but the important part of the demand is the excess demand, which is investment demand, and that's what's going to drive the market. Again, I think it will be institutions. Unfortunately, Andy, I don't see anything outside of the black swan, which is the caveat we both need to make that we're going to see significantly higher prices this year. Uh, and again, there are all kinds of catalysts out there, so I don't want to downplay it. That, well, David, you said you expected a rather benign market this year, which I do. But all of a sudden, you know, it could change in a half an hour. I mean, we could get something over the news wires, you know, a half hour after this we do our interview, and all of a sudden, you know, there's a huge anomaly. That takes place. So, you know, I'm on edge about that, but uh, that aside, we need new demand, which means everybody that's in the silver community ought to be letting everybody that is not involved in the silver market get involved. Remember what I said a couple of frames ago, that only 0.2% of all financial assets are in the, in the physical silver market. 
Just think of that double to a whopping 0.4%. What would that mean? And that's why silver will outperform gold, because when the panic hits, everybody's going to grab whatever they can get, just like in that movie Rollover I used to show early in the speaking circuit. You know, when the financial panic hits at the floor trader in New York City, and he says, you know, sell everything that you can and bullion, grab what you can get and pray. I mean, it probably is going to get close to that scenario. Right, and that's what it had. That's kind of what it was like in 2008, except they they then had central banks that were armed with uh, with with ammunition to save the day for a couple of years. But look, from my perspective, both at Miles Franklin professionally and from a personal perspective, and I've written about this recently about the new investors. The, you you have it exactly right. The people again, and we're very secular here in America because yes, we have a bigger influence on financial markets than other countries our size, but we are just a small part of the 7.5 billion people in the world. Uh, and, of course, our market is more maintained by the uh, the powers that be over here. But the fact is the people in this market uh, that typically buy are people like us. I guess you would call them stackers, right? We are full, okay? You know, the, the, the days of, well, I hope it goes down so we could buy more. No, no, we, we're full. Okay, I, I'm telling everybody here, Three quarters of my liquid net worth, I'm full, okay? Unless I make massive amounts of new income, I can't buy any more silver and gold. I have all that I'm going to have, right? Uh, and I think that's the state of most of our clients. They've, they've been buying steadily for years. So what we need is new buying. Now, in 2008 crisis, we had new buying. It came flying in. In 2011, when the prices hit $50, new buying came in. We even had new buying at the time of the Shemitah scare. A whole bunch of people swarmed us buying metal that we didn't see before. So what it's going to take is something new. It's something that changes the mindset. And obviously, record high stock prices is not going to help that. Now, again, this question was kind of silly, as David was kind of referring to, because it could change anything. I mean, who knows? You can't even say without black swan. What if the economy just keeps falling as it is, and the Fed has to change the tune? and go back to QE instead of, you know, pretending they're going to raise rates. So there's a million things out there that can create new demand. But right now, we're kind of stuck in this end of this Trumpflation meme where the stock market is high and no one cares about precious metals. And that said, still the prices have been going up and are, and are right now challenging their 200-week moving averages and, uh, and the five-and-a-half-year downtrend line. So I think we're in really, really good shape. And I think as we get to our final question here, I think we've pretty much made the case that there's not a heck of a lot of supply out there. There's not going to be a dramatic amount coming to market. The inventories uh, that are above ground haven't changed much. They're minuscule in, in the big picture. And uh, all it's going to take is, is some kind of uh, event that makes people want to change their tune from uh, stocks to precious metals uh, to make that go. So that said, Finally, I'd like to address silver trading, starting with the reliability of exchange data. In my mind, it's unfathomable that the massive paper precious metal pyramid has lasted this long atop the minuscule inventories purported by the world's leading exchanges. On the COMEX, for instance, a measly $550 million of registered inventory is all they purport to hold. This after roughly two-thirds of the inventory has been withdrawn since the 2008 peak. Meanwhile, though London OTC trading data is not published, a crude estimate of the relationship between trading volume and physical settlements uh, suggests no more than maybe a half billion dollars worth of actual metal changing hands over there each year. So to conclude, I want to ascertain from my panelists whether anything unusual appears to be afoot, particularly at the comics where they now, as of last week, had a record high silver commercial short. Uh, and uh, this, as at a time where we have the, the metals right up against their, you know, 200-week moving averages. So I'm not going to read all this stuff right now. Open interest is soaring. Naked shorts are soaring. Craig, let's start with you. What do you think is is happening at the Comex and any other parts of the world in trading that's different? Is anything different? Does anything look to you like it could be changing soon? Well, the key is to understand, and, and David was touching upon this uh, uh, earlier in the call, the key is to understand what role uh, the COMEX plays in all of this, because uh, as David pointed out, right when we got started, I mean, the world produces, I mean, let's call it 900 million ounces of silver a year, but industrial demand takes up, what, two-thirds of that? David, if I remember, you mentioning 650 million, something like that, right? So, yeah, yes. All right, so we've got... 200 million ounces left over every year. 
for investment purposes, uh, you know, speculation, uh, insurance against financial collapse, all that kind of stuff. Well, if price was determined based upon the demand for that 250 million ounces, well, then we'd have a whole other situation entirely. What has to be managed by the bullion banks is the demand for that other 250 million ounces. And they do that by creating new supply, not actual physical metal. They get the world to believe that the supply of the derivative is uh, okay and, and could be used to price this physical metal. Again, what, why is the gold-silver ratio so skewed? It's because there are these, all these derivative contracts and, and the shares of the SLV and all the, everything else that's out there that is treated as if it's silver itself when it's not. And so when you've got, like you said, 250 million ounces left over on an annual basis from an investment perspective, uh, that makes, obviously, you've got to come up with supply of something and call it silver if you're going to manage the price. If you go back to the beginning, I think it's really about the time the first rate hike, back in the middle of uh, December after price had come down, the total open interest, the total amount of contracts on the silver COMEX were about 160,000. There's 5,000 paper ounces per contract. So we're talking about 800 million ounces of, of silver obligations on the COMEX. As of last night, that has grown to nearly 230,000 contracts, or about 1.15 billion ounces of paper silver on the COMEX. So the banks have, think of it as, as all this excess demand has come in from speculators, hedge funds, managed money, whomever that says, I want to own silver, but I, you know, I don't have a place to store it. You know, it's cumbersome. You know, I can't just go put it in a vault someplace. It takes up a lot of space. So, okay, I'll just buy these COMEX contracts because everybody says that's silver. So this demand has come in for silver. Again, there's only 250 million ounces a year of actual physical. But the COMEX has created 350 million ounces of fake paper silver in those the last four months to meet that demand. And so nothing's going to change until these institutions, these hedge funds, uh, you know, m mutual funds, large investors, whatever, demand physical metal, not these derivatives. Because as long as derivatives are, are accepted as a substitute for the physical metal, then this game can continue to be played in the short term. Yeah, no doubt about it. Having open interest at record levels, having the amount of uh, large speculators, that's what manage funds and uh, manage money, things like that. The amount of large speculator long positions, all-time record high. The amount of commercial, the, the big banks, short positions, all-time record high. Uh, open interest, as I said, all-time record high. Unless something dramatically changes, one of these black swan events that forces some kind of commercial short squeeze like we saw in 2011, then I think everybody listening to this would be foolish not to think that, once again, the banks with infinitely deeper pockets than these speculators, that the banks aren't going to win. And you can see it even just in the trading action this week. Uh, we all thought, hey, you know, gosh, silver's looking good. And as you mentioned earlier, Andy, it's, it's, a pri it's above several key moving averages, both in the short term and the long term. But that doesn't matter when as, as demand for the derivative comes in, they're just simply created from whole cloth by these banks and fed to the speculators. If you can increase the supply as rapidly as, as demand increases, then the price is, stays the same. In fact, right. e Econ 101 would teach you if you can increase the supply faster than you increase demand, price goes down, which is exactly what we think. If open interest back in 2011 was routinely uh, about 40% less than it is now. So, uh, again, a lot of uh, understanding where we are currently with price uh, is going to be a function of, of, of whether the banks uh, are successful in rigging price back down and, and whether we can finally break the shackles of this pricing scheme and break the banks and drive them out of what is really a very profitable trade for them is going to be physical demand and finally getting large institutions, pension funds, insurance companies, uh, hedge funds, whatever, to not to say, no, 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 no. I don't want any of this uh, uh, this paper obligation that where, where you know, you, you say it's silver. No, I want the real thing. 
uh, it's a confidence game that it is a real thing, and we need somehow that confidence uh, to finally be broken. And until then, it's going to be really hard to get price to move substantially higher. Right, and and actually that is the a, a perfect perfect description of today's snapshot in time. And again, you know we're talking about last year, both gold and silver paper volumes in these paper exchanges went up by fifty percent just in the one year, and that was in a year where they were unsuccessful in keeping prices from still going up. The point is that that demand that we're talking about, which eventually will switch from paper to physical, as we saw in say 2008, is getting larger. Uh, for I mean, look, the prices have bottomed, which is for institutional money the number one thing, and of course these moving averages, which clearly this week they are defending uh, to the to their death. Uh, you know, these we I mean, now three three days in a row of these big dumps right at the right at the open of the comics. The point is the desperation is getting larger because the demand is getting larger. And of course, it's also creating the bigger distortions, you know, bigger short positions that eventually have to be covered, more interest in the metal from people that see the price going up despite all of this shorting. And of course, you know, you're talking about we need an event. Well, we got plenty of events, you know, from the mundane like, oh, the Fed having to switch to lowering rates just because the economy to the millions of other political and geopolitical events like, say, oh, bombing Syria or North Korea or Marine Le Pen potentially winning the French election next week and a million other things. And the point is what Craig is saying is that the, that the scheme that we've all been watching, uh, some people for 10 years, me for 15, uh, David for 20, uh, is, getting, is, is becoming more of a Ponzi scheme <laughs> with each passing day, larger and larger and more unsustainable. Uh, but at this snapshot in time, that's, you know, I'd say it feels like the darkest before the dawn, but actually prices have bottomed and have been moving up, so it's not the darkest. The darkest was two years ago when the price of silver was 13 and gold was $1,050. So that's an amazing description, Craig. Uh, David, do you want to follow up what you think about the current trading conditions and, and what you think might be on the horizon? Yeah, thank you, Craig. The markets have been trading much differently for about a year, and this is due to the advent of the SGE, the uh, Shanghai Gold Exchange. And it appears as if the stronger hands are the Chinese, and a lot of the increase of the 40% that we've talked about has to do with their with the Shanghai Gold Exchange. So let me explain a little better. It looks to me that the shorts from the commercials, the big banks, the bullion banks, the powers that be, are being met on the long side by whomever at the Shanghai Gold Exchange. And if you go back to the trading of last year where we saw from January of 2016 all through the summer, and summer months are usually weak for the metals, they continued higher. And what was happening as the open interest increased, it was a tough time for the commercials to shake free of this continuing being matched with uh, buying pressure with somebody that had probably as deep of pockets as they do. This is a new game. So what took place was that the Chinese yuan was admitted into the IMF basket of currencies in October. And at that time, and you can conspiracy theory this to death, I'm speaking fact, at that time, the Chinese basically put their hands in their pockets, and then we saw a big boom downward in the price of silver, and that momentum carried all the way into the end of the year. So it's trading differently. I think from all I've seen is that the shorts can only do one thing, create more of the paper paradigm, and Craig, you did a great job. But where does it end? It ends when the rubber meets the road. When you say, okay, all I want is one-tenth of my paper position cashed in the physical. And the other part I'll add is the watching the warehouses, which I've done for years. Whenever we have seen the registered supply, which is really the float, everything else in those warehouses is held by long-term investors and has to have a certain uh, signature to take it into a sale position. In other words, it's in a vault, locked up, and no one can get to it. 
and to be sold, there has to be a contract that's a new one that says you can come out of the safe and be put on the market. So the float is called registered. Whenever that's at 30 million ounces or less, roughly that number, I have seen a good strong move in the silver price. Right now, which we is where we are today. Which that's is where exactly. we are today. That's where we are. Right. So again, and we'll move on to Steve here. We're, we're talking about a position at people, and again, the. You know, the best part of this conversation is Craig's setup of where we stand today. But it doesn't change much in a market where there's so little inventory out there and so many potential catalysts. And again, the mining industry has clearly been neutered to the point where there's just no chance of a material increase in supply, to a physical to supply to, to stop, you know, to, uh, to cover all the demand that could be coming in. All it takes is a crisis. And we haven't had a crisis, and we should have a crisis. We should have a much bigger crisis than we've ever had before, one in which central banks simply will not have the ammunition that they had last time, let alone the credibility uh, to save the day and, and kick the can. Uh, uh, Steve, I'll give you the last shot to discuss your views on trading right now, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, Andy. Uh, you know, Craig at TF Metals Reports does this great, and you know, uh, the, 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 let's say the most important thing to understand comparing gold and silver to Bitcoin, Bitcoin has only so many Bitcoins out there. So when there's a large, let's say, amount of Chinese going into Bitcoin funds, their, their amount of uh, Bitcoins are capped. There's only so many Bitcoins they can purchase, even though there's other mechanisms going on. So when more money flows in, the price moves up. But as Craig has mentioned, when more mo money moves into uh, gold or silver, then they just add more open interest. And uh, GATA put this release out, as well as uh, uh, Craig did at TF Metals Report, that they started the, you know, the futures exchanges in, in 1975 to funnel money away from physical into paper. So this has been going on now for four decades plus. Uh, and so there's really not much I can add to that, except we're at a record uh, of, of, this, of this paper silver and paper gold holding the price down. But um, I would like to put the whole silver investment demand going forward into perspective if we have a concluding comment before we end the conversation here. Right. Well, I will conclude by saying that the things that are going to drive that change are A, crisis of any kind, whether it's a financial market crisis or a geopolitical crisis or even a plain old political crisis within this country like a debt ceiling that can't get resolved or, uh, or bipartisanship that's out of control uh, as you know, Trump fights Republicans, fights Democrats and everyone else. And of course, the other side is the hyperinflation that must inevitably occur as all the central banks do what they always do to kick the can. And right now, I think we're in the final stage of that. Uh, with only the only thing really that remains is the Fed having to turn turn tail and get back to what they're best to doing, which is printing money. So, uh, on that note, I think this was a very fascinating hour of insights from, in my view, and, and, and you know, I've been doing this a long time, these are the top minds in the, in the silver realm and the precious metals realm in general, and I encourage you to contact and or subscribe to their various services at silver-investor.com, srsrockoreport.com, and tfmetalsreport.com, respectively. Moreover, if you are interested in purchasing, selling, or storing precious metals, Miles Franklin, now in its 28th year in business, without a single registered complaint, would like the opportunity to earn your business. To that end, I write a free blog each day at milesfranklin.com and can be reached by email at ahoffman at milesfranklin.com. Thanks for listening and stay vigilant. It's a mathematical certainty that precious metal prices will protect your net worth over the long term. And at today's historically suppressed levels, especially in silver, there's been no better time to purchase the most valuable financial insurance available. Thank you to my panelists and thank you to all listeners.